in for a shock in London town streets when there's darkness and fun when you least expect me and you turn your back I'll attack Welcome to the Geek and I podcast. We are part of the Geek News Now podcast network. You can find all the information and news you need for the world of geek at geeknewsnow.net. We are also on Facebook at Geek and I podcast, facebook.com slash geek and I podcast. And you can find the Geek News Now at facebook.com slash geek news now. We are also sponsored by Metallic Dice Games for everything you need for your gaming experience. Use code GNN at checkout and save 10%. Let's bring him in, my co-host, Mr. Jeff Dickinson. Jeff, how are you, sir? Dude, I'm feeling blessed. Uh, As you know, this last Monday, December 7th, was my birthday. Now, as friends out there in the world... you, you, know, you know you got some cool friends, but when you start getting that shout out, especially on your birthday, how you may have changed your life without you knowing it, that's awesome. That's pure awesomeness, man. So I was blessed this last Monday. And thank you, especially you, sir, for giving that shout out. Oh, happy birthday. So do you want to introduce our, uh, our, our next guest this week? Oh, my God. Okay, check this out, guys. This is a personal killer friend of mine. I've known this dude since the 90s. He is an amazing soul. Well, let's welcome the male god in the making, Patrick Kinnison. Hello. Thanks for having me. Right brother. Hell yeah. I'm hungover, but I'm here. (laughs) Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Anytime, brother. So, um, where where are you now, um, Patrick? Jeff said you're from San Antonio, but um, currently you're in... I'm in Los Angeles. I've been out here since 2003. Okay. And uh, right now, I would have been on the Alice Cooper Lita Ford tour, but that's not happening in 2020. That's supposed to be 21 now. So, I'm home, uh, keeping myself busy, and just trying to keep from going crazy like the rest of the world. <laughs> Staying safe, I hope. Staying safe, you know. I tell my friends, I say, you know, I I don't want to be paranoid, and I don't want to be reck. Here's paranoid, and here's reckless. I'm somewhere in between that when it comes to <laughs> to, to this yeah. whole thing. I'm not yeah. going to be paranoid because my life doesn't work like that. But I'm not going to be reckless either and just act the fool. You know? Right. So you're kind of reckonoid. I'm a reckonoid. I like it. There you go. We're gonna we right got the name of the new album, Reckonoid. Yes. <laughs> So well, I want Patrick. To- let me let me do this real quick. Sorry, John. Patrick. Now, since we've known each other for a very long time, I want to bring the world to a particular moment in time on when the first time I met you, and that was at Krabby Jacks in San Antonio off of two eighty one. You're hanging out on the patio. You're jamming. You're doing something cool and special, and we talked that night. And what was cool about that was. When we talked, we shared a bond of music in such a huge level. Now, sir, my sir, we talk about our first albums, the ones that put us on that track level. And what I want to do here is share two with you. I know we all talked about this. My mom has the original. This is a re-release of the Beatles. Back here, you can see the two labels. This is the capital version. And albums are so important to our world because you got some cool stuff when you open them up. They had cool stuff on the back, the lyrics and whatnot. But what's cool about this particular album, it had this inside. Now, these days, that doesn't exist. And my second one, being Boston, this is my original. Once again, open it up. Had some cool stuff there. And what I dig the most about this particular album, and this is the one that I play a lot. If you look here, not only do you get the lyrics, there's a guitar, the uh, like like a blueprint. Oh, that's That's kind of killer. What was your 
influences and the albums you picked up that meant the most to you? <clears throat> well, this was the first heavy metal album I heard. I don't even know if they called it heavy metal at the time. My older <laughs> sister played this on her turntable. And growing up in San Antonio, Texas, there was a, uh, uh, a DJ called Joe Anthony that would break bands. He broke Rush, Def Leppard, Judas Priest before the rest of the country knew what that was. Um, so I heard this when I was about seven and blew me away. As much as I had loved Cheap Trick, Kiss, and ACDC and Aerosmith, this had a, a, a crunchy guitar, fast drum thing that appealed to me. And I remember looking on the back of the record when I was seven saying, this is what a badass man is like. This is what it must be like to be a man. How funny he turns out to be gay later, but it doesn't matter. He was a fucking badass from the start and the vocals. Oh, I mean, I just, this, this started it all. And then years later, of course I was a crazy fan. This came out and I was like, okay, this is the best music people have ever made. Everybody says the of the space. started it. I, I think Judas Priest was was the quintessential heavy metal band, even though Black Sabbath started it. Yeah, no. no I most certainly agree, man. Judas Priest, when I heard the Ripper for the first time, man, that spoke to my soul. And by the way, the advice my mom gave me, we talked a little bit about this before. You got to put on the cans, man. For you kids out there watching this video right now, throw on the headphones and enjoy the music the way it's meant to be. Now the 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 um the Judas Priest song that really stands out to me is probably because of I would say MTV had the influence on me and I had just um seen The Road Warrior. So to see the video for you how you got another thing coming, you know, and playing it we we had just purchased our first stereo television back then. And I think I blew out the speaker the first time that song came on MTV. Uh, and my dad would, you know, he would never let, let it down, you know, let me down. He's like, oh, the TV would sound so much better if uh, the speakers were working, right? But, uh, yeah, my, my, my two aren't really, um, I, I wouldn't say they're like heavy. As you can see from my room, I'm more of the movie person. So my influence is more of a soundtrack, John Williams. Um, Jerry Goldsmith, old school um, composers and stuff like that. But as far as rock, um, this one, this one here was was an important one to me uh, growing up, um, just because of the sound that it had uh, from the uh, you know the Mister Roboto sound. And as far as the one that got used the most when I was little on my, you know, little tiny $20 uh, record player is, is this one, um, the Beach Boys greatest hits. And boy, this, this thing is so worn. I mean, you can see from the, just from the missing pieces of, of the, of the album <laughs> cover. Uh, this got a lot of use and is is something that was always usually hanging on my wall in one of those uh, protective cases and and um, just hasn't come out of the garage until now. This is the first time it's it's come out of the garage in twenty years, I think. So, um, wow, yeah, That's it's good stuff. I did a gig with the Beach Boys a festival in Canada about a year ago, a little over a year ago, <clears throat> and I'm aware of the monstrosity of the Beach Boys and the harmonies, but I got to tell you, uh, after Lita played, I stuck around, waited for the Beach Boys to come on. About nine guys got on the stage, no backing tracks, um, uh, original one original guy, and then like maybe his son and and some other people. I got to sit side stage and listen to them play all those hits. And what blew me away was the harmonies were perfect with no backing track, no auto tuners. No BS like that. And me and Lita's bass player, Marty, would just look at each other. We're like, dude, we just went to school. <laughs> These guys are real. No one's on a click track. There's no BS going. They had a cool video screen behind them that had, you know, stuff from, from yesteryear. Uh, I, I just walked away from that thinking, yeah, these fake auto-tune 
pre-recorded bands need to stop already. There, There's groups of people that play real music. And even if that sounds like an old guy thing to say, I don't care that you could be from any part of the country and go, okay, those guys are amazing. Right. So, well, yeah. that's what I appreciate about uh, Rob Halford and Priest, because when I used to go to the Sunken Gardens, because, you know, working with Kiss Radio, that was cool because I got cool concert tickets, and Pantera especially. You, These guys are raw. I mean, they were, yeah, you got your sound check and whatnot, but no, man, these guys were like, one to see Pantera with typo negative, dude, that was killer. Yeah, it's like you're witnessing something, you know, hearing something pre-recorded is like putting in a movie or something. I mean, that's fine and it's consistent, but you want to go to the show that night when the singer sounds a little, maybe what he's a little hoarse, maybe the drummer's playing a little bit fast. Maybe the guitar isn't perfectly in tune. I don't know what it is about that, but maybe it's, I don't know what it is. It's something natural and awesome about that. Well, well let me bring you to uh, a level here. And it, it's like when I first met you, we'll, we'll go back to the Krabby Jack days, if you don't mind. You were hanging out, and I, I literally sat back with you as we were kicking back with some drinks, and I was telling you, dude, you got to be in a bigger band. And you're like, well, I have one. It's called Union Underground. We're coming up. And it's right before you signed that contract with Sony. Let's talk about that for a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, I was, without tooting my own horn, I was always that guy who had a band that would win the Battle of the Bands, you know, ever since middle school. And then I would win the guitar competitions. <clears throat> and um, people always tell me, you know, you're so talented. But I got to say, I remember coming home from school, putting on a Priest album, and learning how to play each thing by ear. Uh, and my mom was super supportive of all that. And I just kept working at it, took guitar lessons. And it was, you know, other kids were fig figuring out how to finish Super Mario Brothers. I wanted to know how to play all of Eruption. So I just kept working at it, working at it, working at it. And um, <clears throat> by the time I got out of high school, I realized I could make money playing music in a cover band, the Max from San Antonio. I got a paycheck to, to play music. And I had they would have me sing the harder rock songs and everything. And at some point, uh, I didn't want to travel as much because my other friends were playing acoustic duos and trios at places like Krabby Jack's, bringing home some of the same money. And I was like, oh, I can do an acoustic trio and have more time to work on my original band, Union Underground. Perfect scenario in my head, can pay bills and work. So that's when you and I met. And Union Underground, I was putting my same work ethic in. We have to sound badass. We have to have great songs. And then if somebody hears a song, they can't show up and we look like some stupid garage band. We have to look like Pantera and Motley Crue made a band together. You know, that's what I'm thinking. So we had video screens. We had pyrotechnics at the time. Um, we did have backing track. We would put, at the time, it was uh, post-grunge industrial music. So we would put a drum. The drummer would play his drums, but there'd be a little drum loop going or a weird sound effect. But we were still live. And uh, we started to get the attention of labels of people in California. And uh, we started selling out shows in San Antonio. It was kind of surreal, but uh, I, I kind of felt proud, too, because we'd worked so damn hard, you know, to get free cassettes out, free CDs to people, getting played on the local show. And people would come see us and they'd say, this does not look like a local band. And I'm thinking, you're goddamn right it doesn't. <laughs> 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 we finally got a record deal. And... Um, Oh, man, I remember we got the deal. We got six figures. And the first thing we did was pay back people like my parents and people associated with the band that helped us with all that stuff I said that we got. And um, that was kind of, you know, what we just, what we did. It was the end of the 90s. Now you, well, you mentioned when I walked the, um... into Musicland and saw your cassette, literally, Musicland, shout out to old school San Antonio, in uh, Windsor Park Mall, we were talking, and you said, one day, my cassette's going to be out there in the music world. And when I saw it, literally next to the cash register, I was like, Patrick finally made it. You know, you didn't tell me. By, making, I found out about I, your by making it, I had to pay people back a lot of money. 
So you, you mentioned that first uh, that that first guitar that you started to play uh, and and play by ear and learn stuff. Um, now I have a I have a picture here of that rocker to be uh, with his his first guitar. So could you what could you tell us about? Uh, oh wow! What could you tell us about this? <laughs> okay, if you look at that, that is my first electric guitar. I was twelve years old. You can see in the background an Iron Maiden Trooper poster, a Motley Crue Shout at the Devil album. Uh, I see my Judas Priest hat. I was just, and then I'm, I'm, I have a, a guitar magazine. I learned how to read tablature, and I was just at that point right there. I was playing the intro to every heavy metal song I could find. So I played Breaking the Law. I played uh, Shout at the Devil. The Maiden stuff was kind of tough. I remember trying to go ba 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 she she was happy that I wasn't doing drugs. She's just like, okay, he's this is what he does. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I guess by the time my bands would start playing about a year or two after that picture, people would be like, oh, shit, these guys can really play this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, that gives you, I don't know, it gives it's an addiction almost. Like, wow, I can play Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. Can I write my own songs? Ooh, scary. Oh, whoa, that one kind of seems kind of cool. It's It's like somebody giving you a hundred thousand dollars that's never enough you need a hundred million dollars so you keep trying to figure out how to get that next hit again right let me show you a picture of of a guy with a guitar his first guitar who never went anywhere with that guitar um <laughs> yeah i <laughs> that that thing uh, i would play it all the time and i just couldn't get the right sound out of it so i would just keep cranking it down and cranking it down until and then one night i'm in the it's it's like the middle of the night and i hear <laughs> and the whole bridge just just pulled up from the back of it and uh, i never played the guitar again so i always tell people acoustic guitars are scary at first because the strings are like two inches off the fretboard that's like trying to type on a stone keyboard it's really tough uh, so I always tell people, you got to bring the action down. The neck has to be straight. It'd be like driving a car that doesn't have power steering, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that can turn people off. So you want to hear something funny is that my first guitar was a six string and you're way better, by the way, than I will ever be. And because we, we, talk, we talked about this in the past, but I'm not going to bring that up. But you're talking about, you're talking about I decided me. to go from, you know what, that six string is cool. But let's play that 12 string. And I got really good at 12 string. But you know what? You can only level up, but your talent has got to be at a certain point. And I remember, you now we're both Catholic school boys. Went through those days and, and hanging out. And when people ask you, what's your favorite album? And I was, would say, Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast. That's, you got to check that out. But then again, the nuns were around. They're like, what, the Beast? It's kind of hard to be a rocker when you're in Catholic school. Now, about your Catholic school days, Patrick, do you mind sharing a funny story about that? Oh, I got a lot of them. I was actually kicked out of Catholic school. Um, they threatened to kick me out. And my mom said, well, fuck that. I'm taking him out myself. <laughs> I used to wear, I would wear my older brother's concert shirts underneath my, uh, my uniform. And I'd even have the pins sometimes on there. And wow, you know, yeah, I was into the number of the beast album and, uh, I remember Diary of a Madman, and they freaked that I even had that. Shout at the devil. They found that in my book bag. There was a parent-teacher conference. They asked my mom, who got, Patrick, these albums, these satanic albums? My mom said, I did. And so next thing you know, I'm in public school, and uh, it went a lot better. Catholic school was terrible for me. It was very, I guess I'm going to use the strong word and say communistic. It didn't work. They did not like my hair touched my collar. They said I had to be cut. I told my mom, I don't want to get my hair cut. Um, it just was bad. It was bad news. And, and maybe that rebellion at that age of 12 was what I needed. I don't know. But that influenced your music, right? 
Absolutely. I'll write a song today thinking of how I felt as a 12 year old outcast. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so let me ask, let me ask you about, about that writing uh, process. What, what comes first? Is it, is it a, a lyric that pops into your mind first or is it a melody or a, or a riff or something? And then you, you, you say, Oh, that kind of sounds good. And then you work a lyric into that. Or is there a lyric that says, um, wow, I need to, that's a really great line. Let me put that to music. Which, which way does well, that come? Today go? it comes out all the ways you just said. When I was a kid up through my 20s, you know, I mostly just concentrated on guitar. So it was always a guitar riff. Let me get this riff going. Let me see if I can program this drum machine to work with this guitar riff. Uh, but since I've been a lead vocalist uh, officially in the, you know, since early 2000s, no, now it's, now I can, I can watch a movie and a lot of times a character that I'm into will say something and I'm like, oh, that's the opening line of a song for sure. You know, and so or I'll see something written somewhere and I'm able to come in that way. I don't have to have the music. I could put the music around the vocal, but it took years for me to do that because I always thought music came first. And uh, as a vocalist now, no, I, I can see a group of lyrics or a group of words and think that might be saying something. The, the Well, as for me, Ryer, you know, when I write poems, I think about you, brother, because we, we talked about this before, like I said, uh, where you start writing. And for me, I start with the words. And then you, sir, I think start maybe, if, correct me if I'm wrong. You said normally you have a melody in your head before you start writing the words. Is that right? It, it varies. It can be, it, it, it can come any which way. I uh, Now that I'm older i open myself up i'm like it doesn't have to be the melody first we can construct a melody from words we can construct words from melodies uh and we can bring the music in any time sometimes it still is old school with the guitar riff i pick up and i start I'll, I'll start playing one of my favorite songs wrong and i go hold on if i move those two notes i now have a new song because i just played this weird thin lizzie song the wrong way you know, and then I tell somebody, you know, I just ripped off Thin Lizzy, right? And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> so well, um, I was thinking about like Daylight Dies and uh, the Takeover. By the way, I'm going to do this nationally live. Thank you, sir, for letting me use the Takeover for the Raven Room Org. Uh, appreciate that. That's still in the works. But the Takeover, personally, for me, the way I took it from you was more of your anthem like hey i've done this and then when daylight dies dude that thing made me cry bro that was some awesome work i might make you cry when i show you where i stole daylight dies from you play you it go, you want to go deep on this one <laughs> Fuck yeah, do it. no i'm not playing the song i'm just going to show you i'm going to show you what i meant about ripping stuff off uh okay. properly so I had a band before Heaven Below. We did a cover of, uh, what's that song called? Just like the white wing dove sings a song, sounds like she's singing. Ooh, baby. What's that? Uh, Fleetwood Mac, right? Yeah, uh, Stevie Nicks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so we did a cover of that, and I kind of rewrote the music. And I never was happy with the cover. And when Heaven Below formed, my bass player said, why don't you rewrite the vocals since the music was rearranged on that song, you'll have a new original. So I think the uh, the Edge of Seventeen song is And the days go by la da da la da da in a world that is my own I begin again. You know the song. And then right. I had kind of rearranged the music and then I thought Still I count the days and nights since I survived. This lonely a bit. You get it. I mean, it's the same idea. So instead of just like the wild wind of six songs, sounds like she's singing. I was like, no, that's not what it does. It goes, I can't live without your love and I can die. So I guess the point I'm making is you can extract melodies and chords and grooves and come up with your own thing and you probably would never have known that daylight dies had originated from edge of 17. definitely didn't see that coming 
Yeah, some people would call it a ripoff, but I would call huge bands that are successful ripoffs of something. <laughs> well, we, we we appreciate the bands that we grew up with and some of the music that we hear, especially, you know, that touches our soul. That's the main thing about music. It touches our soul. And what's cool about this thing is that you now, sir, are touching other souls that are inspiring musicians. And you are not only an influencer and a musician, but you're going to be a male god one day. Trust me. <laughs> Judas Priest better hire me then. <laughs> so I'm how, still waiting for you to do the Judas Priest cover. <laughs> how, how does it um, how does it work like when you get a uh, a gig with Lita Ford? Do do you go out and audition for that, or do they just have your phone number and or you know agents that are that are similar and know each other, and they just you know grab the phone and your your phone rings and it's Lita saying, hey, you want to join the band? This one worked like this. Um, I've always been a networker to the days of Krabby Jacks to, since probably right after I got kicked out of Catholic school. I always networked with people. Um, so it was early 2000s. Union Underground had our deal. We were selling 5,000 units a week, which meant something at the time. And a friend of mine worked at PV. And I met him when he worked at PV and he said, hey, I play guitar too. I took lessons from Joe Satriani and I jammed with him at the PV uh, uh, compound in Meridian, Mississippi. And the guy's an amazing guitar player. Fast forward 10 years later, the guy is the president of BC Rich Guitars. This is why no you way. always... This is why you always make friends with everyone around you, not just people that are already in positions. You make friends with people that might be going into positions. And uh, he calls me and says, hey, uh, now that you live in L.A., you know Lita Ford's looking for a guitar player? I was like, really? And uh, I said, I didn't know she was active. I thought she was gone, like retired or something. He goes, no, she's back. She's back, has a killer band. So he set up the audition, and I went down there. And um, Bobby Rock from Vinnie Vincent Invasion and Nelson was on drums, and he is a phenomenal drummer. So I was like, whoa, this is the real deal. And then my buddy Marty was on bass. I had talked to Marty a few days before the audition. Marty said, man, you're a good vocalist. You should learn all the backing vocals, all the harmonies on all those big Lita songs. He says, that's one thing the band could really use. He said, oh, you probably got the gig as the guitar player, but show her how you sing. And uh, I said, okay. So I did. So I, I went to audition. I have the audition tape. I put it on my, I still put it up sometimes on online. And uh, every time I sang, well, I show up and she sees my cool BC Rich guitars and says, where'd you get that? And I said, well, my buddy who got me this audition. She said, oh, of course. So we're already looking at guitars together before I even plug in. Her dogs are all over me. I'm an animal person. So the vibe <laughs> is happening for sure. So once I plug in and we start playing, I go up to the mic on each chorus when we're when we're playing the song and I sing the harmony vocal and she turns around every time I do it and she keeps doing it on all the songs and I'm starting to think am I sucking or fucking up the words or something <laughs> and uh, it turns out she was impressed that I that I could sing all those parts and knew her songs like that so after I left there was other famous guitar players coming in to audition and I'm like yeah I don't know if I have this gig this guy played in you know this band and that band this other guy uh I'm exiting my exit about 30 minutes later to go home and her manager calls hey where are you at I said well I'm going <laughs> to be at home he goes can you come back and I'm like well yeah I guess so I turn around and go back and I play <laughs> another five songs with him and then by the end of the whole thing uh I had the gig so what's it? What's well, it like to be the? By, uh, uh, close your eyes forever. When you did that cover that Ozzy did, brother, my brother, that was awesome. Yeah, that was Lita putting me on the on the spot. She's like, "We're doing some acoustic shows. How about you sing the Ozzy part?" I'm like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> That's some big shoes. Yeah, yeah. So I have fun doing it. She gives me a long leash. If you've ever seen us live with with me playing with Lita. Well, did you ever get a chance to meet Ozzy and talk about that? No, not since I joined Lita. I only hung with Ozzy in 2001 when Union Underground did the OzFest. Nice. Yeah. I remember you touring the world, and 
I was living vicariously to you, brother. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I that's my bro. And I would tell people, like, going, you got to check this band out. And I was pipping your band out without you knowing half the time. But, dude, when you said, and we're, we, we'll talk about a private conversation between you and me, that you got Bill Shatner to do a Rush cover. Dude, how the hell did that happen? Well, I played on that album. My buddy calls me out here and says, hey, I'm doing a cover album with Bill Shatner. And, and you know, Patrick, you know all these covers. You've played them in the Max. And when you saw me playing, he's like, I know you know these songs. So uh, my buddy says, can you come in and play some of the play guitars and the backing vocals? So I go to the studio. He has the, the drums and the bass ready. I play guitar and then I cut some backing vocals. It's going good. Then I go home. I guess this seems to be my pattern. Then the, <laughs> my producer calls me a couple days later. Can you come in and sing a lead vocal so that Shatner can know where he's at in the song? Just sing a guide vocal. I said, of course. Wow. So I go in there and I do a guide vocal and it helps Shatner. And somewhere along the line, Shatner says, uh, Mr. Kittison, if you ever need any help from me on something you're doing, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm like, okay, that's weird and awesome. Uh, so a few months later, my band Heaven Below is recording a group of covers. And we each pick a cover song. Of course, I picked the Judas Priest one. The drummer picks Rush Subdivisions. And I told my drummer, I said, well, I like that song, but I'm really going to feel weird if I have to do that whole. So, and then I go, Oh (laughs) my God. I said, I was told by William Shatner, if I ever need him to reach out, he should do the subdivisions. (laughs) Dude, inside of 45 minutes after talking to my drummer, I had William Shatner saying, of course I'd gladly be on your, your cover of the legendary rush song. That's how the fuck that happened. Wow! Now, when, you, when, you awesome, his, man. when you do his uh, his his temp track for him, do you do it in, in your style or do you do it like? William no, I, no, I did it. I did it more true to the original, even if he strayed from it because he kind of talks over it. Mm-hmm. But if you go hear like uh, his version of Bohemian Rhapsody, that's me on all the backing vocals and a lot of the <laughs> guitars and and stuff on that album. And uh, mostly, more than anything, it was just fun to do. Right. Yeah. Right now I'm I'm looking at your um I was on uh, Apple Music and looking up a couple of your albums and the the one that is um titled the the rest in pieces uh how how did you what made you want to do something like that? Yeah, that kind of morphed into its own thing. So with the, with the success that we had of the Shatner subdivisions, you know, he tweeted out to his three million people, and we, all these people downloaded it, and all the rush thing. We were like, man, we need to do some more cool covers. Um, and I thought, let's do an album of bands that have disbanded or or are gone, and it will be like, you know, we'll we'll do bands like Motley Crue's over. Uh, I don't remember at the time who Twisted Sister is over. There, we were making all this. And as we started recording the songs, people start dying. You know, um, Dio had been gone. Uh, of course, Freddie Mercury had already been gone. And then we said, hold on. I think this is going to be a tr- an album to tribute everyone who's passed, not bands that are disbanded. Uh, so we, that gave us a focus. So I quickly recorded a version of Like a Stone, Chris Cornell, Audio Slave. And that, that felt right. I did that right after his death. And we said, this has to be an album of all people that are gone. And we, you know, we came up with album titles. We're like, let's call it I Hear Dead People. You know, we get all these stupid titles <laughs> going. <laughs> so, let's call it Rest in Pieces, Tribute to the Departed. And uh, it just kind of, it made a life of its own. We made a list of all these bands. And I remember us saying, let's cover one of the biggest rock songs ever uh, that a gazillion people have recorded, but we have to do it our own style. That's the challenge, not songs people haven't heard of. I said, well, We Will Rock You is probably one of the biggest hard rock songs ever. Uh, and then we're like, oh, God, do we really have to go boom, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap. <laughs> Everybody's done that. It's done. 
<laughs> so that's when we came up with the whole fast, hard rocking version that Queen kind of did live back in the day, but we made ours a little more Judas Priest sounding. Uh, and the album kind of took care of itself. It seems like once we had the list of all the, the, the dead people that we love, it started, it started the track listing became apparent. Yeah, and I, I want to ask one you of about the the, uh, the way the way you reimagine the the songs, like all the whole list of 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 all, especially like "We Will Rock You." I mean, the, being the first track on on the album, you you can tell that it's not anywhere near the original. So how does how does that? Do you guys go through some kind of a what kind of process? Do you go through to to change it so it is yours, but still pays tribute to to the original? Well, with the Queen, I remember hearing the live one, and it went, it went. Buddy, you're no man, oh man, leader with your eyes, gonna be a big man someday. And I was like, well, I don't want to go. I don't want to Johnny be good it. That's awesome, but that's not what I want to do. And then I kind of just play games in my head. I'm like, what would Judas Priest do if they were gonna play that song? Oh, they would go. You know, I, I of course on electric, I didn't do it on acoustic, and mm -hmm. it sounded big through my amp. It goes chuck up, chuck 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 chuck, chuck but it, almost like a Rob Zombie vibe. Buddy, you're an old man, poor man, pleaded with you. I was like, yes, <laughs> that sounds like something I want to hear when I'm drinking alcohol. And I took it to the band and said, can we do this? And my drummer, of course, is like, oh yeah, we can do that. And he starts playing the beat, and then. We at that point we could have made it an original. We could have just put new vocals over the music like we did on on Daylight Dies. But we said no. Let's let's do We Will Rock You as if we wrote it. And uh, other songs like the ACDC or the Pantera, those we left intact. We said we can't take every song and rework it to death. Let's do some that are that are purposefully sounding like the originals. And we did that on a few of the tracks. So that way we kind of had a little variance on the record. And I, you know, going th going through that album, I, I, I really wanted more information on each song, and you know, I, I really, I really missed the the liner notes. Like Jeff had said in 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 you know showing his us his records, you know, to 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 know the backstory of how each one uh, you know affected you guys, um, it's something that's really that I really missed. Uh, listening to that album because you know I, i'm not a like we had mentioned I, i'm not a heavy rocker i do i do enjoy a good you know head bang every now and then um priest is one of my favorites you know zeppelin and uh you know the the, the basically the standards um but i really wanted to know how each one you know came about do you do you find that liner notes are something that's missing nowadays? And how do you get around doing um, liner notes? Is there a way? Well, you know, I guess honestly, I feel like as old school as I am, like you guys are with the vinyl. Um, I'm by no means cutting edge guy. I don't know. I barely know what uh, Snapchat is, you know, and this kind of crap or TikTok. <laughs> but I do find myself getting. I guess stuck in the well, get it out to the digital mediums. And I, I can't always think, oh man, it needs a digital booklet. I remember we did digital booklets in like 2010, 12. I don't even know if those are a thing anymore. Uh, so sometimes I'm guilty of getting swept away in what new technology does. So when somebody like you brings that up, I have to immediately say, yeah, he's right. I wish I wanted to do that too. Maybe that's for the vinyl release. <laughs> Maybe that's how we're going to remedy that situation. You know, maybe maybe we'll put out a cool little box set of all our stuff and it'll have a book that could have stuff like that in it. I, I, I am totally all about that. I was the guy looking at the Iron Maiden albums, finding every little tiny thing in the artwork, too. You know? Well, the coffin thing you did, and I appreciate, by the way, you sending that to me. The whole coffin with all... I can't remember what album that was, because I've had pretty much almost every album of yours Except for recipes. There's another coffin coming, so watch out. <laughs> but that, that was awesome. Now, how did you decide to do a coffin? Being a huge Kiss fan when I was a little kid, Motley Crue, Metallica, the cool stuff. Um, I, had, I just had this idea. I saw somebody like the Misfits do a coffin, but it, it, it was just cardboard. It, it was pretty cool. And uh, 
it was Halloween and I was on eBay and I saw this guy selling this coffin that you could put your candy in and you could lift the lid off it like a tomb and it was real wood. And I was like, damn, that looks cool. So I already started thinking I could put my own artwork. We could be inside the coffin dead. I, my brain just started going wild. I reach out to the guy. Turns out he lives in Nevada and uh, we became friends. And I said, can you send me a, a, can I buy like just 10 of those just to see? He sends them to me. I get a CD. I'm like, a CD almost fits. I hit him up. Can you do a, 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 a cut so that a CD drops in it and kind of floats in the middle of the coffin? He's like, yeah, I could try. It works. Next thing you know, we're like, okay, now we need to do a photo shoot where we're dead inside the coffin. We need to put <laughs> stuff inside there that, that it has a theme. We need a special shirt that goes in there. Um, the only, it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's an item that doesn't, that costs a lot more than a $10 CD. But I tell you, when we put them up there for pre-order, people jump on them. You know, it, it has to be $100. The thing costs a lot of money to put together. They're handmade. They have artwork on them. We sign them. And uh, they're such a hit for us. And it's a good moneymaker for us. We, um, we can move a lot of those. People, collectors are like, I have to have that. This is better than uh, the box set from Metallica. You know, Metallica mm -hmm. can't do a wooden coffin. It would be $1,000, you know. So... We just, I don't know, man. I'm just, I'm just feeding into that 12 year old kid that was kicked out of Catholic school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, dude, I'm telling you that coffee, I wish I should have had prepared, but I appreciate that. And I think a lot of collectors like myself, we all collect you, sir, collect two things, mainly guitars and albums. Now what started guitar collecting? Honestly, because I was lucky enough to have some success and I got endorsements right after Union Underground started getting big companies come to you and they want to give you guitars. All of a sudden I had 40 guitars, but even before I moved out to L.A. And uh, I was like, this is awesome, but I'm not really playing all 40 of the guitars. I'm playing like 10 of them, 12 in the studio, maybe. Um, so it just kind of happens. You get companies behind you. They're like, let us send you our seven string acoustic. And I'm like, there's a seven string acoustic. And uh, <laughs> and that's kind of how all this kind of starts to happen. Um, I remember when I moved out to L.A., you know, it's expensive out here. I sold a bunch of the guitars, not all 40. I probably sold like 10 of them. I was like, let me I got to get raise some more cash, you know, uh, to get out there. And I sold a bunch of the ones I don't play. But then I got a Schecter endorsement. Now I got I'm back up to a ton of guitars again. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. impressed. Can you can you uh, the the um, albums that are on the wall behind you? Can you tell us what they are and what they're for? Yeah, uh, let me see. I'm I'm reverse. This one over here. Where is it? here? I had moved out to L.A. Union Underground was no longer on a label, um, but I'd made friends with a, a big music producer that was working with Union Underground before it died. Um, his name's Scott Humphrey. He'd done a bunch of uh, Tommy Lee albums, and, and his one of his main artists was Rob Zombie. He tells me, would you like to, uh, can we hire you to play on one of the new Rob Zombie songs that's going to be on his greatest hits? I'm like, yeah. I'm thinking, you don't even have to give me money. I would just do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, okay, well, be at my house. You know, uh, he gave me a day or two later, and uh, I'll have Rob come out, and we'll, we'll have you record on a song. And my buddy Scott says at the time, the producer says, Rob needs a guitar player. There's a solid chance you're going to be in Rob Zombie's band. He goes, you're, you're perfect. You'd be right in there. Well, it sucks to hear that um, because I did go and I did play on, on this song uh, on his album. The tracks came out great. It's called Two Lane Blacktop. Uh, I got along great with Zombie. Great guy. Uh, we talked about heavy metal. We, he told me about his movie making. We talked about Metallica and all the things. And the tracks came out great. And then I, I learned shortly thereafter that John Five was the was going to be the guitar player for Rob Zombie. And I couldn't be mad about that. John Five is an amazing guitar player. If he had got somebody shitty, I'd be pissed. Um, <laughs> and Rob went for went for a big a big name and and, and put uh, uh, John Five in the band. But I got to play on that um, that so that was pretty cool. And then the three behind the directly behind you. 
this is so now you know they used to give you plaques for for uh, how many albums were sold but now things have morphed it's about how many streams um and Whoa. somebody brought it to my attention that heaven below had you know over a million streams on daylight dies um so the the subdivisions cover has got insane number and so we ended up being able to get a plaque for over three million streams of the heaven below catalog but i gotta say it's closer to five million today so <laughs> i'll take it so that's bad kind of, yeah you know it doesn't pay the same as people buying a cd but i'm just happy if i was doing this for money i would have quit a long time ago um <laughs> So I'm happy that people stream Heaven Below the way they do without a Sony Columbia or without a, a, a Rob Zombie or a huge manager. So I think that counts for a lot. And then, um, yeah, so it's the Zombie, the Heaven Below streams, and then the William Shatner. It debuted at number one on Billboard when that came out, that thing, and they gave me a plaque. I have another plaque coming for YouTube, a million subscribers or I don't I don't even know what it's for, but for the William Shatner, <laughs> I better find some more wall space. And, yeah. and then in other parts of the room, I got some of the Union Underground ones. And, you know, at first I was like, God, it's so braggy. Look at me, you know, to even have that <laughs> shit up. And then I thought, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah, it had that success. I shouldn't downplay it either. You know, you shouldn't no. you shouldn't uh, blow the whistle on 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 someone having more success or no success, whatever. So. I'm okay with it. Yeah, I think there's a difference well, between well deserved, dude, because hanging on your wall, you know, and somebody talking about it when they ask you, then you going, "Hi, my name is Patrick, and here's my gold album." Yeah, you know, it's like you hand it out like business cards. Yeah, exactly. Well, like I was going to say, it's it's well deserved, bro, because you're the most talented person. Well, let me rephrase that: you're the most talented motherfucker I've known that picked up a guitar outside of Eddie Van Halen, which I met personally. And I thought about him when I hear some of your music. Did Eddie ever influence you in any way, Absolutely. shape, or form? Because that's the reason why I picked up the guitar. I remember uh, my older brother uh, playing Van Halen 1. Um, I liked it a lot. I liked the way the guitar sounded. I remember as a little kid, I didn't understand David Lee Roth doing the... <laughs> I was like, what the hell is all that? What are those sounds? Is does he have Tourette's? Um, <laughs> the time I was more into Judas Priest, but I remember loving the guitars on Van Halen and the drums and everything. And I wasn't playing an instrument yet, but I'd go on to learn that, wow, talk about guys that can play in a room. It must have been a great product uh, to produce Van Halen. Must have been amazing. You just set up microphones and hit record. <laughs> well, the two guitarists I think about a lot when I hear your music is A, and of course, you know, uh, Ozzy had a really talented Randy Rhodes backing them up. But would you mind, sir, playing an original music that you wrote? Let me see. What do I play? <laughs> I got Hangover Voice. I'll get. I'll give you. Uh, give you part of something. Whatever, whatever speaks from your soul. How about that? Oh, well, today I'm hungover. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> uh, I'll play you part of this one. So after I moved to L.A., even before I had Heaven Below, uh, I lived with my buddy. His name is DJ Ashba. You know him from Guns N' Roses and 6 a.m. and all that. And we wrote songs together. And um, he didn't write on this one, but I remember this was one of the first songs I wrote getting to Los Angeles. Um and in San Antonio, it's like, wow, Union Underground, big deal. Then you go to L.A. and they're like, oh, yeah, I think I know who that band is. And I used <laughs> to tell uh, DJ and my bass player, John Younger, I'd say, yeah, we're the king of nothing. You know, and uh, <laughs> anyway, this song, I'll, I'll show you. So we started writing this. Uh, Here I am. Useless in your eyes, there you go again, You're faithless every time. I think I've had enough to say, you've had enough of me in my misery. 
goodbye. I'm healing, I'm saving, but still I'm not believing. Denial comes to me. No reason for feeling there's something else controlling this other part of me. So this king of nothing sets me free. Yes, so that was one of the first songs written. Fuck the, yeah. The king of nothing. Fuck you, yeah. You think you're cool in your hometown until you live next door to a gazillion other rock stars. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was how we looked at it. It was kind of tongue in cheek, but that was the first one written out here. I remember when, you, when I first heard that song, when you put out there in the world, I was like, man. And talk about goosebumps, man. I mean, literally, you – I'm only not only proud to know you as a friend, but you speak on a level of music that inspired me just like the Beatles and just like Priest and Iron Maiden. And dude, I, I can't say this enough. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank, for being you. thank you for comparing awesome me to thank you for comparing me something so colossally amazing. If I can have <laughs> just a fraction of that amazingness from the bands you named, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I just remember hanging out with you on the patio and always saying, as we're drinking, dude, you got to be in a band. And you're like, what? I have one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that well, that was a funny time because in Union Underground, we were, you know, kind of uh, creating something that was that was exciting at the time. And music was getting away from grunge. It was industrial post. And then I would go play these acoustic songs on the patio going, if you could only see the way she loves me, maybe you would understand. And so people must be like, hold on, but I saw Union Underground and that guy looked like a fucking member of <laughs> Pantera or Motley Crue. Now he's playing this tonic song, but had to pay the bills, man. <laughs> I hear you, brother. Yeah. yeah I, I, I was impressed. Um, I did a, a you know quick YouTube uh, search and came up with uh, the going going to California that is just beyond Beautiful. insanely good. Oh, thank yeah. you. I always that was one of the first songs I heard as a little kid growing up in the seventies, and uh, I it was probably one of the first ballads where I was like, "That's cool sounding." And then I started playing guitar and realized it's an open tuning and it's not as hard as it sounds. And then I was like, "Okay, I guess I better record that." Mm -hmm. Well, as you can see right here, sir. Huge Zeppelin fan. So when he did yeah. that, it spoke to me, brother. Hell yeah. Well, Patrick, I want to thank you for your time uh, today. Really appreciate it. What do you have? Uh, I, you know, you can't say what's in store for you for the rest of 2020, because I think we all know that we're just going to stay inside and fight over toilet paper. But um, <laughs> what what do you have? What do you have on the plans on the books for uh, 21? Well, uh, I'm waiting to hear about the Alice Cooper, Lita Ford uh, rescheduled dates. That's going to be awesome. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on with Lita. She has a new album that's going to drop. I hope it's next year. Um, and meanwhile, uh, me and Nikki, you know, Nikki from the Iron Maidens, uh, she also plays in Heaven Below. We've been doing stuff online, doing acoustic covers in this room, in the house, staying busy with that. Uh, there's going to be a new Heaven Below coffin is coming out. Uh, we're making noise about a Heaven Below vinyl release of a, nice. a, like kind of like a best of Heaven Below. We want to call it We Sold Our Souls for Heaven Below. And it'll be we want to do a vinyl release. So we're working on that stuff and uh, definitely no shortage of ideas. You know, if we're not on the road doing doing our, our bands, we are figuring out what we can do with original stuff and more covers and acoustic and all that. We're uh, we're not ready to be angry yet. We're we just want to do more music. <laughs> mm -hmm. I get tired of people whining, you know, musicians, I just I don't want to hear it, you know, it's just you gotta make music. You, that's what we do, whether it's behind a computer or on a stage. So that's what I'm gonna keep doing. Yeah, and you can find uh, all your stuff at heavenbelow.com you, you do the uh, you got the merch going on over there and um, you, you're selling your albums and you're on uh, Apple Music and Amazon and Spotify, Spotify all that stuff yeah and all, all that stuff uh, Patrick I want to thank you again it's uh, been an honor to speak with you sir and hopefully next time um, you know if we're allowed out of our houses uh, and you and you make it down to Texas we can uh, we can 
come out and see you see you live because that would be killer i'm into it thanks for having me jeff and john y'all are awesome thank, thank you, you sir. brother All right, soon. and merry christmas merry christmas guys merry christmas we'll talk to you All right got it so jeff thank you very much for uh another great episode um of the geek and i podcast we are part of the geek news now podcast network Find them online at geeknewsnow.net. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Podcast. We are sponsored by Metallic Dice Games, everything you need for your gaming experience. Use code GNN at checkout and save 10%. Jeff, any final words? Well, I'm just blessed that my pathway has crossed so many cool individuals. And I want to thank not only you, sir, for having me a part of this podcast, but I want to thank those who came on the show, showing some love. And I appreciate you for hitting that subscription button and hanging out with the Geek and I, especially the iconic button. So that way you're going to know for the next video. All righty. Thank you, Jeff. We'll see you next time. And thank you for out there for, uh, for listening and uh, viewing this episode of the Geek and I podcast. We will see you on the next one.